Biblical hermeneutics is the science of interpretation of scripture. Most people may have heard the term, but it's, um, we'll call it the science of scriptural exegesis, a method of essentially trying to ensure that we're properly interpreting what's being said. I would say the best way somebody's trying to find something that's a difficult passage is to use certain criteria in trying to determine the meaning. Um, a wonderful lesson on this that I'm going to use today will be to look at the parables of Jesus. Um, in church history, we've had many different people as they have been prolific in their contribution and work into the church churches. Um, say, take a person like Augustine, who was heavily, heavily under the um, biblical interpretation. Everything was more allegorical. Now, my problem with using that concept that, for example, making the understanding of parables allegorical, the problem with that is that's not a right interpretation right off the bat. Um, allegory is best understood by, for example, we'll call him the master of allegory, Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress, where every single point as you read, every point that is mentioned is important to understanding the whole. They are all types of something allegorically put forward for us to read and grab hold of, we'll call it multiple concepts. They're fence pickets, if you will, along the way, but you've got to look at every single detail. Um, there are other people who've done biblical interpretation and they fail to look at the context. I've told you this before. If you're going to read and study the Bible, one of the most important things, I don't care if you leave here today and you never come back, I want you to take this with you because it is the most important thing in unfolding God's word, and that is to make sure that you are looking at the context, the text in its setting as it happened, and with um, we'll call it structured hermeneutics, which I tend to engage in. I don't express this this way, but I'm explaining a method to you. You will uncover along the way some, we'll call them specifics, um, with this method of asking historically, the context historically, the social setting, what it meant in terms of customs, those who would be, say, of you know, the Jews, they would know their customs. So it's important to look at all of this in context. Failure to grasp what was intended in the passage in context before you make an application to yourself usually will result in error. Another great one of these, by the way, is Paul writing to Timothy and explaining to Timothy that he does not, uh, in this particular case, speaking to Timothy, he says, I suffer not a woman to teach. In context, it's, and I've explained this before, Timothy is being bullied around by very rich widows, and you can read up on this and make sure the context is right. Why? Because Paul does not say that to other churches. He's saying it to Timothy. Hey, Timothy, Find a pair and wear them. <laughs> I'm making my, am I making myself clear? <laughs> Failure to understand that brings out people saying, well, Paul said women shouldn't teach at all. They should stay silent in the church. That becomes error. And I'm telling you this because people who bring that mindset tell you what they do. They basically say, I'm going over here to show you the opposite end of the spectrum. They basically say, by virtue of declaring that God is not sovereign, he cannot do what he wants, he has no prerogative because Paul said. <laughs> Did God not speak out of a donkey? 
did God not use some evil people to accomplish his purpose? Tell me, did, did, did God use Pharaoh? Was Pharaoh seen as a man of God? Or was he representational of the heathen religion, which now we, we study fervently, Egyptology, but he was the representation, he was the deity of a corruption or a caricature in antiquity, not a God, Yahweh, the Lord, worshiping person, yet God used him. That's called the sovereignty of God. God can do what he wants. So what I'm saying to you is failure to rightly interpret the text. And man, I've got a whole bunch of people out there right now that are just squawking the box right now because they engage in text outside, not in context, form doctrines, and man, they will go all over the map and tell people this is their doctrine, and they make it the doctrine of the Bible. That's error, okay? So I'm just telling you this because so many times I have people say, well, on this particular point, and they'll go off on some tangent, put it back in its setting first. Deal with the setting and look for repeatables if you find the repeatables, you will then establish sound doctrine. I've said this before. Now, what is a parable? You might say, well, that's a silly question. I know the answer to that. Of course you do. But I'm not talking to you. <laughs> In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word mashal could carry the meaning of proverb or a proverbial saying, a prophetic discourse, a riddle, but in the New Testament, we have the word parable. So let me write it phonetically uh, instead of writing it in Greek, which this word is two words put together. Let's chop this apart. Para, which is alongside, and bole, which is to throw or to cast. So when we come away with the word parable, it is a throwing together or a casting alongside of words to make an illustration. But if you follow, and it's kind of important because people get a little tripped up in this, and I want to put this down first for those who are not familiar with it, and then we can move on to the message. Um, if you follow this word, para bole, the compound, you will find that this is, it trickles down our, the French word for parler, P-A-R, parler, the verb, parler, wow, that looks terrible, comes from this word parable, um, a trickle down from that old French word to believe it or not, an English word, parlay, which is conference or speech. So you've got the essence of the word, but is not to be understood or confused with. Um, metaphor, when we talk about a metaphor, a metaphor is what we encounter when Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the... That's, that would be metaphor. Simile, again, all these words we... Sorry, we're, we all speak English here, yes? yes. Last time I checked. See, ¿Sí? entiendo? See, ¿Sí? okay. <laughs> so, simile will be the use of something to describe something that is like something else. Simile, like similar, simile. But a parable, and specifically the parables of Christ, are being used first and foremost as a story. And when I say this, I don't mean to diminish and call these stories, but I want you to envision first, if somebody said, well, what do I know about this? Well, Jesus' parables are stories that are conveying truths that are designed with a specific, there is a point, to uncover the proper meaning of the parable is to look at and ask a few questions to determine what is the focus of the parable. 
Now, I'm going to go back to this in a minute, but let me briefly just mention, for example, what we've labeled the parable of the sower shouldn't really be called the parable of the sower because although the parable is talking about the one who sows the seed, really in reality, if you analyze the parable of the sower, it is the reception of the seed and the reaction, not the sower himself because the sower never changes. It's kind of weird. It's, I've, like I've said about the prodigal son, we've called the parable the parable prodigal son, but in reality, it's the parable of the father. We just have these labels here, and we go by them, and we, you know, we stick them on there, like the Lord's Prayer, right? Mm, the Lord's Prayer is not Matthew 6. The Lord's Prayer is John 17. When the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray, that's the disciples' prayer. So we have all of these kind of commingled things, and nobody really takes the time to um, separate them. But there is a purpose in the parables that is apart from what I just said. Jesus' parables also revealed and at the same time concealed truth. And let me explain what I mean by that. It's, it's self-evident, but let me explain this. In Matthew's Gospel, which is where I'm going today, if you want to open up your Bibles to the... I'm going to be speaking on about the 12th chapter, and we'll be looking into the 13th. But the 12th chapter really is a, a shift in Matthew's account. A and that shift, basically, is we've now seen... Jesus' own people rejecting him. The Pharisees accuse him of working miracles by the power of Beelzebub. And it is the religious leaders who have turned their backs on the Son of God. This is where, in Matthew's writing, the parables begin. It's important. These are like small details, even if you've read the Bible a thousand times. These are important details to put down. And you can see there is a method to kind of peeling back and making sure we're going in the right direction when we analyze a text. First, the context. What brought about, in Matthew's writing, what brought about the need for Jesus to speak in parables? Well, the answer comes as a culmination pretty much in the 12th chapter. And when you kind of see that momentum has shifted, I'm only talking about Matthew's gospel, I'm not talking about John. In John, in the opening chapter, it says he came to his own and his own received him not. In Matthew's account, it, this is where the shift occurs. Up until that time, and let's not confuse the discourses, the Sermon on the Mount, with these parabolic methods that he uses here. Why? They came to him and they said, Jesus, why are you speaking? His very own disciples said, why, why are you speaking in parables? And he said, because it is given unto you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But it's not given unto them. And he said this, by the way, in, in fulfillment of what the prophet Isaiah had declared. Now, why is this important? Because we've covered a, a method and then you realize that as this method is unfolding, there's more information. In fact, when you begin the 13th chapter of Matthew, you, the, the 13th chapter opens with the parable of the sower. And you almost have to, you have to excuse me when I do this because I'm making you look at the 13th chapter. But remember that there were no chapter and verses, even in Matthew's account, those separations and divisions came later. So if you were kind of reading this to make this a cohesive and in context, the very ending of the 12th chapter has Jesus talking to the people. It says, Behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. 
Then one of them said, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my, ma my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. And you have then the transition into the parable of the sower. The same day went Jesus out of the house, sat by the seaside, and a great multitude were gathered together unto him so that he had to go into a ship so that he could be speaking to all of them while they were on the shore, he's in the ship because there's this great multitude that is gathered. Now, I think I've, I'm going to just kill this one more time so we're all on the same page. The understanding, for example, of the one who comes to him in Luke's gospel, and he asks the question in Luke's gospel, who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes on to explain to him or illustrate to him in a parable by virtue or by way of the Good Samaritan. And so it's this type of method. But the reason why I'm highlighting this today is because I think it's valuable for us to go and look at certain things, the very familiar, and instead of being, as I've just done now, I've spent the last, what, 30, 20, 30 minutes kind of in an analytical mode in trying to explain a method or an approach, which is necessary, by the way. It's like saying, you're going to make some food. You, don't you need a recipe? Now, when, when you get really good, you know you're going to use these ingredients, and the, the degree of ingredients may vary. But at the beginning, you're going to use a recipe. That's the meaning of using a method to unfold that eventually you can come to the point of knowing you're in the right direction because it's, the, it's these same principles that go through the Bible. So um, I think I have answered in part the purpose of parables, um, which would be to inform, to persuade, but also to reveal, conceal, the nature or reason why Jesus used parables. As I said, the shift from the time that people were still inquiring until they kind of turned their backs on him. And then it is at that point in Matthew's gospel where he begins to speak in parables. And the framework for interpretation, studying the setting, the context. Uh, I have a quote here by Bishop Lightfoot, who said, the background of the parable and the context of the passage in which it appears will help immeasurably. And that is what I just spent 10 minutes trying to stretch out, which is make sure you are using proper technique to unfold something. So now let's look at the parable of the sower. It's a place we've been to, we're all familiar with, but I want to use it to show this as a way of uh, approaching something. So the same day went Jesus out of the house, sat by the seaside, great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell on stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some, some fell among the thorns, the thorns sprung up and choked them, but other fell into good ground, which brought forth fruit, some a hundred, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And how does this portion of this section end? He says, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, you could just kind of put this down in great clarity. Jesus will go on to explain it, and I'm going to follow what he does. But the illustrations bring forth the concept of a hard heart, a shallow heart, a choked heart, and an open heart. So sometimes people get hung up on the parable, but go straight for the guts of something, because that's what Jesus is talking about. That's why I said it's strange that we've labeled this the parable of the sower. The, the things that will be reoccurring throughout this chapter have much to do with seed and the sower, but everything has to do with how it is received. Now go back and reflect on what I just said in the 12th chapter of them rejecting Jesus. And there you have a, 
a portico, a foyer, an entrance into the parables by virtue of demonstrating something in real life. They rejected him. Not everybody can receive the words of Christ. Not everybody desires to hear them. It will not take root in everybody. This is why when people, and people do, say some crazy things, like, you know, well, you, you ought to be more forceful in trying to get people to come to the Lord. Hello. How so? Because I just explained, and the parable makes it clear. The sower has not changed. The seed has not changed. What changes along the way? The reception, how it is received, whether it's taken in and it finds roots or not. And we just happen to have four different types. But let me kind of go continue on here because I think it's interesting to look at this and rightly see why this whole unfolding that Jesus does sets a clarity for us on salvation and how our mindset should be, how our mindset should be if we have received the word, and when I say it's taken root, and then don't go comparing yourself to somebody else. There's nothing worse than that. When you see that person or how, how they are, how are they doing? Doesn't even the good soil that receives, they don't all bear fruit the same way. Some 100, some 60, some 30. In other words, not everybody produces fruit for God the same way. So even in the good stuff, in the good soil, don't look at your neighbor and, and think, well, I should be like that or they should be like me. Just saying. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But um, unto them it is not given. Now some have said this is, this is a cruel thing, but it's not. It's called the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. And there are people out there who absolutely do not believe that man has free will. There are tombs of theological uh, treaties on why. And again, you, if you want to knock yourself out, you read some of the writings, specifically from the period of Martin Luther forward, and you will find a chock full of head spinning, oh my God, these people actually fought over like one, one letter, one word, yep. But all for the bigger picture, which was some who took a more, um, you know, everything is predetermined, everything is predestined, there is no, no, there is no free will within inside you to decide, which to me completely contradicts the book of Genesis. First, Adam had, he could have, been obedient to God. And when Eve did what she did, he could have said, well, you better take it up with the big man because I have my instructions, and that's not what he said. Anyway, we'll come back to that at another time. Whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath. No, that's just not fair. Why? <laughs> Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, ye shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and ye shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your, your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Let me stop right there and say, then this is Jesus saying this. Jesus is saying, not Melissa Scott, not preacher person, whoever, A, B, C, or D. Jesus is saying, not everybody can receive. 
this puts in the toilet that whole concept. I remember a couple of years back, some, somebody was propagating the idea that everybody's going to be saved, including the devil. Okay. Whatever you say, but that's not what the Bible says. You got to go to the last book. Book of Revelation tells you about the devil. And last time I checked, the lake of fire is not a hot tub in paradise. <laughs> Hear therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, now this is what I want to explain, and understandeth not, understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, catches the way that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. Now let me stop there because it's repeated many times and understand it not. This is not to be construed as folks that come for the first time and they say, gee, I don't, I don't even know what she's saying. I don't understand it. We're not talking about that. Know the difference, and there, there are different Greek words for gnosis, that is knowledge. This particular word that is being used here in the Greek has more to do with perception and reception. So it's pivotal that we, we get that, because you could read this and say, well, what happens to a person who doesn't understand? And I've told you there are plenty of people. How many people here, when you first started reading the Bible and studying it, did not understand what you were reading? I'm honest enough to put both hands up. Hello. Yeah, I see you. So this is what we're saying, because otherwise, if, if it was just that you don't understand it, and you say, hello, and you don't understand it, then you'd say, well, am I, am I part of those people, um, stony, stony ground? No, that's not what's being said. So I want to make that clear, because it'll be repeated again, that hears and understands has more to do with perception and reception. And this is why the parable, the sower explains the four, we'll call them possibilities. So, he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath not root in himself, but doeth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. i got to stop right there. You might say, well, what does that mean, persecution or tribulation because of the word? You go to that church? You go to church? Your, your friends, your family, they just find out you're going to church. You go to church? Wow, you're, that's messed up, man. We don't go to church. It can be something as minute as that, which is because of the word, or it could be what Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, especially those people standing for him. When I say stand, it doesn't mean you're in the pulpit. It means you've taken a stand. Jesus is the Son of God. You trust him. Your salvation, for your salvation, not by works, but by faith. So someone who has the ability to listen, but the minute that trouble comes, like the guy that once said, well, I wish I'd never heard Bible teaching. Really? Because that tells me your mindset, you sit right there in that second group, unfortunately. When things were going good, you were celebrating and you were busy, you know, this is great. But the minute things fell apart because of the word, you're done. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world, what people think of me, how they see me, the things that I might be involved in that I put over and above, more important. I prefer these things over God. What did Jesus say? He that prefers not me over mother, brother, sister, he names them all, cannot be my disciple. Prefer, that is putting in order of preference, the thing that you choose first. It's like going to the buffet and picking a nice, green salad first, because you know it's healthy for you, versus, you know, going to the donuts right at the end. <laughs> ah, stop it. That's not the cares of this world. That's called gluttony. 
and the deceitfulness of riches, those people whose sole pursuit is about money. And money, the Bible says money is, it's not that money is the root of all evil. It is the things that make money the root of all evil, the greed, the drive, everything that takes precedence versus what Paul said in Christ. Everything essentially is and focuses around. He is the center. He is the circumference. He is the all in all. So he choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. I call this the choked heart. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Now this is, he just finished explaining this, but he'll do a little bit more. And I'm sorry if I'm reading a lot, but it's important because I want to pick this apart. What is being made clear here is the king is describing his kingdom. And you either have the capacity, it is given unto you, that doesn't mean perfectly and automatically and immediately, or you don't. And this is why I don't try to lasso people into the kingdom because you can maybe get, sorry, I'm going to say it like this, it's going to come out real bad, you can maybe get someone. I've been to many church meetings where they've prayed over, and I mean prayed like vultures, prayed over somebody. You know, and then all of a sudden, they, you know, it's just like a, a barrage of people until that person is either overwhelmed, they're, they, they, they're hyperventilating, or something's going on with them until in the moment, and that pressure, they will then say, yes, yes, I, I believe in Jesus, and I'm sorry, I've never seen salvation come like that. I haven't, because a lot of those people who are forced into it, they will learn the book, but they will never learn about God. They will learn how to repeat chapter and verse, but they will never have God in their heart. Having God in your heart, whole different story. It means imperfectly, but receptive. And it doesn't mean I'm just going to, oh, I'm just going to, you know, grin, bear it. But let's read on, because the rest of these, the first one sets the tone, and then you've got the wheat and the tares, or like I like to say in common English, the wheat and the weeds, right? And I didn't say the wheat and weed, I said the wheat and the weeds. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed. And this you want to kind of maybe circle, I did in my Bible, in his field. The emphasis being, it's his field. These things confirm other things of the Bible, which is the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the people that dwell therein. All walks of life, Right? But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, weeds, among the wheat, and went his way. When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares, the, the weeds also appeared. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? And they say, thy field. From whence then hath it tares? How, are, how is it that the weeds are there? And he said, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? He said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, the weeds, you also root up the wheat, the good stuff. But let them both grow together until harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, the weeds, bind them in bundles, and burn them. Gather the wheat into my barn. Let me stop right here, because there's some good stuff. Just, I just went right by it. So, gentle Jesus, you know, the sweet and syrupy Jesus, he just basically said, there are two groups of people, weeds and wheat, the good stuff and the bad stuff. And he says, you know what, I'm, I'm not even going to deal with this right now. Let them all be together. And this is referring to this particular parable carries with it the culmination of the end of the age 
where it says, until he says to the reapers, and the reapers are the angels, by the way, and he says to the reapers, go and gather ye together first the tares. This is speaking of an end time, if you will. But what it tells me is Jesus recognizes. He sees it. He knows it. Some are destined for one place and some are destined for another. And when we talk about heaven and hell, people just get, it's as bad as talking about money, right? Well, I'm telling you right here, this is what Jesus is saying. And what's interesting, by the way, is I, I put a little tag on this to remember it by, which is, and he says, gather the wheat into my barn. So either burn or barn. <laughs> hmm, pick a door. <laughs> Which door would you like to go into, the barn or the burn? But there's an interesting thing, by the way. I just want to say this real quickly in passing about the word barn in this passage. It's actually from the word, the Greek word for barn in this passage is apothekin, which we get our English word for apothecary. And what I thought was interesting is in its early uses, apothecary could be shopkeeper, pharmacist, one who stores away. But if you keep tracing the word, someone who puts in place, someone who safe keeps or safeguards, and I like that when he says his barn is like the safe place. Um, the apothecary, if you will, of the Lord is where his people are going. Kind of a cool little thing. I like that word. And it reappears in other places in different ways. But right here, it just kind of struck me as, that's kind of cool. We move on to the mustard seed. This is another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid three measures of meal till the whole was Leaven. Now, all these things Jesus spake unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Now, you go back and ask yourself the question Is it, do you think it is at this point in Jesus' ministry context, do you think he's trying to reach the multitudes now? Or is this the very thing where he says he's basically come to bring division? And you can see here where the division is. Now, he's speaking to the multitudes, but then he will go on to soon speak directly to his disciples. He says, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Explain it to us. Now, remember, this is why I said to you, don't use the concept of what I read to you in verse 19, when they understand that not the wicked one come. That's not the same. They came and they asked him for clarity. That is perception and reception versus rejection. That's what the driving force is here. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. Now, I just, you know, Jesus is just saying, now look, I, I'm, I just put it into the most plainest form. Comprenez-vous? Right? As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in fire, in the fire, so it shall be in the end of this world, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then, the righteous shine, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Three more parables now to come. Actually, four, but... Let me just tackle the three, because I have some commentary in between, and then I'm going to kind of bring this all together. Again, now he's speaking to his disciples. The multitude's gone. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, 
the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. There is a reaction. All of this is driving home reception, reception, rejection. And the ability to receive versus the ability to not. Now, remember, these are being spoken directly to his disciples. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, gathered the good into the vessel, but cast the bad away. Again, keep repeating this concept of good and bad. So it shall be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth, sever the wicked from among the just, shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Let me stop before I finish what's going on here to say this. When we touch something like this, it seems very apparent that the method now is clear. And unlike the multitudes who did not understand, the ones that said, you heal by the power of Beelzebub, and you're, you know, who is this man? Well, this is, this is the carpenter's son. And I just juxtaposed bookends of the chapter I'm reading. And you see some specifics that are being drawn into each and every one of these parables. And that the focus is not and will never be on the sower. That's why I said it's important to kind of get the right picture in the parables. The parables are focusing on reception, how the word of God is received, how it is then ultimately and eventually understood. And we may not understand things perfectly, but that's the beginning. Now somebody says, don't, you know, I just, I just pointed out to you the reason behind making many of these messages was driven by these that I've said to you are the, um, call them skeptics issues, is because I've encountered over the years so many people who have become very dear to me, but they are not interested. They are absolutely not interested in the Bible. They don't want to know about the church. And the unfortunate thing is when you start digging and you start learning about church history. Church history isn't about dates. It's not about antiquity that's irrelevant. You start learning that there's been hundreds, if not thousands of years of corruption, of greed. I mean, it's the greatest, honestly, it's the greatest novel ever written. If you want to find every dimension of the human capacity at work, it's in these pages. No Hollywood writer can duplicate or replicate what's here. So when we come to an understanding of these particular parables, it's like taking a bow and arrow and shooting for the center. It's, it's speaking specifically to the heart of man or mankind or humankind. How does an individual completely and wholeheartedly reject? Well, they did in Jesus' day. What a sad thing when I hear people say, well, I'm just not interested, or I'm turned off because I had a bad experience. Well, be turned off on the institution, if you will, but don't be turned off on God. Anybody who says, well, I just, I'm not, you know, that just doesn't cut it for me. And you're prerogative, but at least take the time to examine, investigate, peel back the layers to realize Jesus is saying something, by the way, in all of these parables that's quite profound for people who are listening to me today. And this is what's so profound. He says, some people don't have the capacity. You are blessed because you do. What he spoke to his disciples. Now I'm taking, I'm taking the very text. Now I'm lifting it up because I've made clear what the meaning is that he spoke to the multitudes and he spoke to his disciples. Now I'm speaking it to you and I'm saying, you are blessed. You want to put it colloquially? You're lucky. You're very fortunate because there are people who are not interested. And as much as I may want to pray and teach and tell people, until one of two things happens. 
God either opens up the heart, the ears, the eyes, the mind is ready to receive. I've called it God turning the soil of our soul until that happens or until there is a shutting down. Somebody may come, they hear, then they get disinterested or disconnected. That's another what I've said, choked off or hardened heart. That just says no. And we lump everything in the same category. Somebody, I was talking to somebody the other day who does not even, forgive me when I say this, is I, I do not ever mean to sound mm, condescending or, you know, mm, I'm offended by this. But this individual didn't even know the difference between Protestant and Catholic. They just lumped the whole thing together and said, oh, you know, the church with all of its scandals. And, and I said, well, which church are you talking about? I mean, they all, everybody's had a scandal. What, which church are you talking about? Well, the church. And couldn't even give me... A, sorry, I'm a history person. Talk to me about the beginning of the church and the intent of the founder. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The founder, Jesus, who never said, by the way, here, here is, this is a type, you're, a law, if you will, that you're going to live by other than the law of faith to trust him. So when we pierce through all the stuff, lifting this out, we realize something, how fortunate we are, how blessed we are to be able to receive. And don't think this is unique to Matthew. The Apostle Paul writes this in Ephesians in a different way. But he explains it from his side of the equation. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this same Jesus, he hath quickened us together with him, made us alive, given us new life. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. So the reason that I'm highlighting this today is if you just kind of sort out and go to the, we'll call it the core of things, you realize from the hard heart, the one that says, no, I cannot, to the uh, choked off heart, which starts off one way and then suddenly cannot. If you kind of go through the shallow heart, somebody who's kind of fickle, they can't really commit to anything. And then there's the open heart. And only, by the way, the master surgeon of the heart can do that open heart surgery, if you will, to open up the heart, because we all start off the same way. So piercing through this, it is the reception and the ability to receive. Now, Jesus asked them final words from this uh, put together in verse 51 of the 13th chapter. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord, yes. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. I've heard people deliver messages on just this one verse, but the reality is you've got to look at it collectively to see the whole picture and see the wonder. And this is really my focus now, and I'm bringing this to a close. It is the wonder to me if you go through church history and specifically church history in America and more specifically the last 50 or 60 years you'll find that the idea of salvation, the way things are received, has grossly been perverted. Because according to the words of Christ, not everybody has the capacity. Is that, what, is, is that your understanding as well from these things? Yes. So I'm not, this is not a private interpretation. I wasn't really asking you that. I was making a statement. <laughs> My point is this. Sometimes I think we become very laissez-faire, very relaxed, very, eh, it's all, it's no big deal. But let me put it in a way that kind of speaks in a psalm or something, which is, blessed are you who have been given, we'll just say it exactly the way Christ did, to understand or to desire to understand or to desire to understand and receive the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. We may not 
understand them all perfectly. As Paul said, we see through a glass darkly. But the beginning of desiring is reception. Tell me more. I want to know more about this. I need to understand this more. Keep telling me about this so I can wrap my mind, at least the portion that's usable, wrap my mind around it. That'll hit you later. (laughs) And for those people who are listening, that's the miracle. The miracle isn't somebody says, oh, you know, you got to pray that God will bless you and you'll have lots of money and big houses and cars. That's not it. You've missed the mark. Pray for something else, but recognize how blessed you are that you have the desire, as Jesus pointed out, to be able to receive. And what is that worth? This is the, the other thing that is a complete repulsion to me that I see within Christendom. When people ask this question, well, what is it worth? Usually that taps into, well, shouldn't you essentially give all your stuff away and be charitable? We're not talking about that. What is it worth in terms of how can you put a price on being chosen by God? How can you? Because God could have left you in his sovereignty. I'm going back over here because that's the other side of the room. (laughs) Right? God in his sovereignty could have said, not you. I don't want you. You probably wouldn't have told you that. You just go through life thinking you're the golden child, right? I'm looking at you up there. (laughs) God could have left us all there. I think about me. You know? I have the same, I had the same option as anybody else. No one forced me into being a Christian. And then suddenly it's, it's the desire, the desire is there. The desire to learn, the desire to know, the, the incredible desire, oh my goodness, here it comes, to be in church every Sunday. Which prior to coming to church every Sunday was what for me? The sleeping day. <laughs> right? The kicking back, don't want to know about anything day. This is like the highlight of the week for me, right? So it changes everything. What I want to tell you is be a little bit uh, cognizant of the gift that God has given you. Even if you're faltering and you're having a lot of difficulties, be aware that God chose you And put this in your heart. Now, you have the free will to say, I don't want it. But as I'm speaking, I'm hoping that there will be people to say, wow, you know, I never thought of it this way. I'm one of those like the disciples. I want to know. I want to understand. I want to hear. I haven't rejected. I haven't said, I don't believe any of this. And then be grateful because that is, to me, the greatest thing that one could ever have comfort of as you go today, as you, some of you wrestle with your salvation and your problems and issues and whatever you're dealing with, the thing you should kind of let settle in is you could have still been out there drifting, looking, maybe searching, maybe finding the wrong instruction. I just stood here, read for the most part of my message, but gave you some solid points to peel apart the scripture. So when, when you are studying, when you're having discussion, when you're contemplating certain things, you don't come to the table and say, this is, I'm just going to just twist it a little bit so that it meets what I want it to be. Rather, this is that. It's quite black and white. Jesus said, two groups of people. I've said this before, and it's probably quite redundant. There are still two groups of people. There are the Judas types, and there are the woman with the alabaster box. There are the types When I talk about two different types, there'll always be an Achan in the camp somewhere, and then there'll be the person who says, I cannot stand before God and do anything else but praise him, tell him the truth, be forthright. So when I say this, it it really makes clear, I am not here to try and, come on now, I'm reeling you in, you know, but rather it's up to you. That's your free will, and God and you together. That's why I said you work it out. You come here, so we open up these things together, make things clear, so that we can kick out some of the garbage that has been imported into the church, where people walk around saying things like, well, if you're truly saved, you would have gone up and responded to an altar call. Hey, the altar call happens 
every time the word of God is going forth. And it's something that is just agreed to in the heart that says, that's right, amen. That's all. Nothing to come forward and make a spectacle of. If you want to do that, I don't know, do, do that in your house. Do that to your family, your dog, your cat or something. See how much they stick around or love you afterwards, right? But I'm telling you one thing. We have a very faithful Heavenly Father who makes sure that when we need that reinforcement, I talked to you about different subjects, but this is one that reinforces something quite incredible. Just the fact that you're listening and interested and desiring to know says God has not shut you out. He has not choked you down. He has not pressed you away. Neither have you to yourself. So my advice to you and my advice to me is to keep studying, to keep faithing, to keep looking at the scriptures with proper interpretation and to keep thanking God that he chose you and he chose me for a purpose. He didn't just leave me out there and say, you know, who cares about her? Or who cares about John? Or who cares about Gil over there? Who cares? He says, I care and it matters. Now, the response is on your part. The ability to react, to receive, to respond. I say no more. I've said it all. But blessed are you who have been given the ability to hear and to understand. And I pray that it just keeps growing more inside your heart until you say, tell me more, I want to know more. And if you want to know more, you got to come back next week. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch Listen and learn 24 hours a day. Simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.